Well, we're glad that uh, you're here to worship with us together this morning. We're going to go over just a few announcements. So if you'll turn to pages two and three of your uh, worship guide, we'll go over those uh, before we do have our worship service together. If you're on uh, page two, if you're a guest with us, we uh, want to welcome you here. Glad that you're with us this morning. Most of the uh, announcements there on page two are directed to you, our guest. And just to read through those, and, and typically we do have a 20 to 30 minute break uh, between our service and our Sunday school uh, hour, and uh, so feel free to join us. Uh, we usually have coffee and juice and donuts uh, in the fellowship hall, so uh, again, if you're a guest with us, uh, we're glad that you're here with us. Moving on over to page three, you'll see the adult Sunday school classes are listed there today. Uh, don't forget that uh, at uh, 6 p.m. this evening, instead of our normal uh, prayer service, we have our uh, annual meeting. So annual meeting is tonight at uh, 6 p.m. And there you'll, you'll see a few things coming up on the calendar, the Valentine Banquet, the fellowship meal at Crenshaw Park, Tenebrae service and Easter service are listed there. Bible Institute is starting uh, March the 4th. That's a uh, Monday night class. will be church history number one. Who's teaching that? That's Tommy. Okay. And so Tommy's teaching church history number one on Mondays and Tuesdays. Is that you, Corey? Okay. So 
Systematic Theology number three in his series there. That'll be on Tuesday nights. So if you want to sign up for Bible Institute, uh, you can do that on the church website. And also more details coming on the Valentine Banquet. Also, we'll, we'll keep uh, the Leals in our prayers. Uh, Vanessa does have the flu right now. So let's uh, uh, pray for her and continue to pray for the family there. Uh, David Goebel's wife, Lana, is going to have surgery on uh, tomorrow. That's Monday, tomorrow. So let's uh, uh, keep her in our prayers. And then uh, today is Barry's and Joe Owen's last day on their mission trip to the Dominican Republic. So we'll uh, lift up uh, Barry and Joe Owen and then also lift up their travel home. So that is the announcements this morning. Also, uh, we have some initial dates for youth camp, July 29 to August 2nd. That's a Monday through Friday this year. And it's still going to Camp Eagle. And if you have questions regarding Camp Eagle, uh, you're going to see Sean Petty. Again, that's July 29th to August 2nd. Open to uh, junior high and high school students. So, uh, any other announcements perhaps that I've missed or maybe I don't know about? If not, uh, then... Uh, We'll continue to prepare our hearts for worship this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Psalm 99. 
I'm going to read Psalm 99 and Psalm 100 as our call to worship, and then I'll pray a prayer of praise and adoration. So Psalm 99. Verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. The king is in, or in his might loves justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy. Psalm 100, a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh, great God in heaven, we're reminded here from this passage how wonderful you are. You are the supreme one who is over all. You are high and lifted up. Your fame extends through all the earth. All of creation sings your praises. You rule the world in righteousness. You judge all people with equity. You're too great for us to comprehend, yet you've made yourself known to us through Jesus Christ by the power of your Spirit, opening our eyes, enlightening our hearts to receive him. And now, this morning, you gather us together You fill us with your spirit that we might sing your praises. Oh, that we might know you and be glad. For you are good and you are faithful. And your steadfast love endures forever. Help us to sing in light of these very truths. Help us to listen to your word in light of these very truths. And help us to delight in you and worship and praise your name. We pray this in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn to page six in your worship guide. And stand with me as we do sing, Oh, Shout for Joy. You'll find that many of the, of the words written here are the same as Psalm 100. So let's sing together, Oh, Shout for Joy. Shout for joy unto the Lord, worship Him with gladness. Let all the earth bring songs of praise, telling of His greatness. Know that the Lord we praise is God, He is God our Maker. And we are His, a people called sheep within His pasture. Oh, enter in his gates with praise, his courts with great thanksgiving. For he is good, his love endures morning after morning. 
Find your hymnal and turn to 153. We'll be learning a new song this morning. It will be, a, it will be our hymn of the month. And so we will be repeating. We're going we're gonna to sing verse 1 and then go right into verse 2. And then the chorus after verse 2. We're going to actually do that twice. So uh, the ensemble and I will do it. If you want to just hum along or try to get it the first time, that's great. And hopefully by the second time we'll, we'll catch on. And uh, yeah, we'll learn this uh, new song together. It's a great song. How, how is it that we can call the almighty God, the creator of the ends of the earth, how is it that we can also call him brother, friend, comforter? Well, that's, uh, that's an awesome God that we serve. So uh, let us sing together, beloved and blessed.
We'll transition to the confession and thanksgiving portion of our worship this morning. If you will open your Bibles, we'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll be starting in verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 30. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word for the opportunity that we have to study it and to read it this morning, for it is perfect and true. Lord, we do confess as a group and individually this morning that we often distract ourselves with the things of this world and at times seek the wisdom of this world, seek the approval of this world. Lord, we too, way too often focus on ourselves and our sinful desires, and we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for that, and we thank you for your patience. Lord, we ask that you help us to seek first your kingdom. And Lord, we're thankful that you, that you choose what is foolish and weak in the world, in the world's eyes, to shame the wise and the strong. And we're thankful that we can boast only in you and not in ourselves. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we'll sing a couple more songs before Tommy comes with our message today. So... You'll turn to page eight in your worship guide. We have one more song in our worship guide this morning, and then one more song in our hymnal as well. So page eight. I guess we could say, perhaps, that this is our assurance of pardon this morning, this song, His Mercy is More. Perhaps you're here this morning and you feel a little beat up. And I'm really not referring to phys physical beating up, but spiritual. But what love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender calls us home? 
what riches of kindness he lavished on us. Free for us, but his blood was the payment. His life was the cost. And because of that, hopefully we are grateful and thankful. And we are so grateful and thankful that we want to live for him. So let's uh, stand and sing together his mercy is more. find your hymnal and go to 419 if you're a believer today I hope you hear the call of the kingdom that we may go out and live in obedience and Spread the word of God. And if you're not a believer today, I hope you hear the call of the kingdom to run to Christ and be saved. Let's sing together. Children of light with the 
mercy of heaven, the humility of Christ, walking justly before him, loving all that is right, that the light of Christ may shine through us. King of heaven, we will answer the call, we will follow, bringing hope to the world filled with passion, filled with power to proclaim salvation in Jesus' name. Hear the call of the kingdom to reach out to the lost with the Father's compassion in the wonder of the cross, bringing peace and forgiveness and a hope yet to come. Let the nations put their trust in Him. King of heaven, we will answer the call, we will follow, bringing hope to the world filled with passion, filled with power to proclaim salvation in Jesus' name. You may be seated. You can turn to Luke 10, and you can hear my voice, my annual uh, horsey voice for January. It seems to happen every January. I tried to prepare preventatively this year, and it didn't work. Uh, While you're getting adjusted to that, I don't know if you noticed the paradox in the first two lines of his mercy is more. I just, re- I just recognized it this morning. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. That is omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their son. Our God who cannot forget our sin. I mean, he's omniscient, right? But he doesn't remember them anymore against us. He doesn't count them against us because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as he pours out his mercy upon us. But I, I, he remembers them no more, but yet he knows everything. And he counts them not against us. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray before we go to Luke chapter 10. Our Father, we have heard your word that has called us to praise and glorify and enter your gates with thanksgiving. We have approached you as Corey prayed only under the banner of the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is blessed and beloved. And as his children has deemed us beloved, we've been uh, called to shout for joy Father, your mercy, 
that which we deserve has been withheld. The blood of Jesus has been the dam that has held back your wrath against us. that which you provided to save us from yourself. And then we've been encouraged to hear the call of the kingdom. Father, I pray that this morning as we open your word and see the kingdom being proclaimed, Lord, you might strike in our hearts the truth there. That we, our Savior, we serve a king reigning at your right hand who will one day reign and rule finally, ultimately, consummately. We serve a risen and glorified king. <clears throat> There's members and citizens of that kingdom. Your people have a responsibility. Lord, help us to hear that call. And one day, we will all stand before the judgment seat and we'll give an answer for how we responded to the call. Lord, what we hear this morning uh, heaps upon us even more responsibility to hearing that call than we had before we came. Lord, we pray that your word would pierce our hearts. We pray that your spirit would crack open the hardness and the thickness and the reticence and the apathy that the word might sink deep, take root, and bear fruit. Father, our neighbors next door are gathering also, and we pray that the call of the kingdom would be uh, heard and their congregation would come forth from their pulpit. Lord, I think about Aaron Wright preaching in Northeast Houston this morning to his congregation. Lord, I pray you would bless the preaching and the hearing of your word, Grace family. Brian Jensen in Pearland. Father, I pray your word would go forth. And all who here would be like these 72 who were sent out returning joyfully for the right reasons not because of success, not because of the obvious physical uh, uh, responses to the truth, but, Father, because our names are written in heaven. Oh, Lord, we are grateful for your kindness, mercy, and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at the first 24 verses of chapter 10 this morning. So we'll be on a, a jaunt through ascending of uh, disciples out to the cities as Jesus has set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem, his final journey to Jerusalem. Uh, we saw last week in the end of chapter 9 that he set his face to go and now he is sending uh, out these 70 or 72 we'll talk about that 
for just a second about the differences depending on your version. Uh, and so he's sending them out to make preparations for his advancement into these cities as he goes south to Jerusalem from Galilee. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. We're going to stop and talk about them, and then we'll read as we uh, go down in the second half. So Luke chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be on this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages." Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. <clears throat> so Jesus is sending them out ahead of him, uh, not necessarily scouting, but preparing for their journey through, uh, we saw last week, through Samaria, and then down to Judea and ultimately to Jerusalem. Some of your Bibles say 70 maybe, and some of them say 72. We're not going to get too uh, distracted by the differences. It's one little jot of a Greek uh, manuscript, uh, a word, letter almost. And uh, so, so if, I don't know what your note in your Bible says. Some have 70 and some have 72 does not change the uh, heart of the matter. Uh, so, and he says, after this, he begins verse 1, after this, and we've talked about Luke not being necessarily chronological, but it seems like this follows what happened last week as we looked. And uh, if it's chronological, he's sending out two by two, notice, he says he sent them out two by two ahead of him. Well, if we were... The, the language there in, in the original, if we look at verse uh, 52, 51, 52, uh, look at 52 in chapter 9. He sent messengers ahead of him. There's the same phrase. He, he has uh, set his face to go in verse 51. He sent messengers ahead of him, verse 53, uh, the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And now in verse 1, he appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him. So it's the same uh, basic language that Jesus has set his face and now he's setting them forward in front of him as he goes about uh, this journey. So uh, possibly... I don't like to talk very often possibly. Possibly what he's doing is he's recruiting these 72. He could have been doing that at the end of 9. And so these three fellows that we met last week, in verse 57, one who comes to Jesus and says, I will follow you wherever I go, wherever you go. Well, yeah, but you need to understand the foxes have a place to sleep, but you won't have a place to sleep if you follow me. And then the next one says, uh, 
the Lord, uh, he says, follow me. And they said, let me go marry my father first. And then the other says, Jesus says, follow me. And he says, uh, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say goodbye to my house. It's almost like Jesus is on this recruiting mission and these folks, and he calls these to follow him. I got a job for you to go. And uh, well, these are the ones who have the excuses. Well, now he's found 72 of them and he is sending them out to prepare for his arrival. And they get their marching orders, beginning in verse 2. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's the need for this mission to take place. The, the, the wheat is ready to be harvested. The field is ripe. So he begins with the... Uh, it's time to gather it in with this idea of ultimately for the kingdom gathering in people into the kingdom. It uh, made me think of the parable in, in uh, Matthew 13, the parable of the uh, wheat and the tares. And the workers say, you want us to pull up the tares so the wheat will grow up by itself? And they said, no, if you pull up the tares, you're also going to pull up the good stuff, let it grow until the harvest, then we'll pull them both up and then we'll separate them. And we'll put the tares in the furnace and we'll gather the wheat into the barn. That's kind of the picture here. The, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Don't forget, don't leave that phrase behind, the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So the need is the harvest is plentiful. What to do in the face of the need? It's a simple plan. First, you stop and pray for the workers in the harvest. Uh, ask God to supply what is needed for this harvest that is ready to be reaped. You know, no uh, long range planning committee, no uh, uh, vision statements, um, no goals and objectives, don't, you know, none of that. Uh, no uh, memorize an outline before you go. Uh, Get these 12 verses in and pack them in a nice little presentation so when you meet these people, you can, you, you can tell them and then you can help them recite a prayer. None of that. It's pray for the Lord to supply the workers and I'm about to tell you what your message and how it is that you're going to minister it. Man-made methodologies, put them aside, trust in the Lord and his ways, and the Lord of the harvest will supply. I mean, what's more powerful than prayer to forward the cause of Christ? You know, some have the gift of gab. Some have the spiritual gift of teaching and preaching and, and evangelizing and doing apologetics. Everybody doesn't have that gift. Some are great encouragers. They have the gift of exhortation. Everybody doesn't have that gift. But every single Christian, from the day they're saved, can pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers. We need to all be praying concerning the mission. Uh, how to help find helpers in Christ's work? Begin by praying. Yeah, we have to recruit. Yes, we have to identify those who can fill the spots that are needed, but we begin by trusting in the Lord. Verse 3, there's a sense of danger. He says, I'm sending you out in the midst as lambs in the midst of wolves. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. There is danger in this. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't romanticize this mission trip they're going on. 
uh, he doesn't uh, enlist them under false pretenses. And this sending out in the, as lambs in the midst of wolves plays itself out in the life of Jesus, in the life of his apostles. As we read through the book of Acts, we see the wolves attacking the lambs as the gospel goes forth. So is it true then, and it's just as true today, as long as the church stands, the wolves will stalk. God's people. The wolves will attempt to distort and pervert and twist the word of God. So Jesus tells his disciples in the upper room, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Or Paul tells Timothy at the end of Paul's life, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If your whole life has lived, been lived in America and you become a Christian here and you haven't experienced persecution that many around the world have that we read about in the Bible time, but there is a persecution of sorts for every Christian as we try to live godly in the world, the world will never understand. They cannot see it. And you'll be marginalized and you'll be minimized and you'll be... Uh, I don't know, whatever you've experienced as you've tried your best to live faithfully before uh, the world. And so Jesus warns them, you're going to come. Remember the foxes have holes. We, got, we have no place to rest. He says it's urgent. There's verse 4. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. And greet no one on the road. Well, don't carry sandals, but they're probably wearing sandals already. They probably have a fanny pack or something on, around their waist. Just don't take any extras, you know. You don't need a lot of extras. Just take the minimum and go. And, and notice, <laughs> whatever house you enter, say peace on this house. If a man of peace is there, it'll lay on him. It'll rest upon him. If not, it will return to you. Um, don't take any extra baggage. No uh, frittering, uh, if you will, time along the way. Greet no one on the road, Verse the end of verse 4. Um, let me just... Uh, I, I, uh, he's telling them to travel light. I would say this is not a general principle for Christians just to minimalize everything in their life. Uh, it's not a general principle. This is a situational stipulation to this particular trip. And the reason I say that, in Luke 22... Jesus says to his disciples, just before he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. See, the very things he says, leave at home here, Later on, he says, be sure you have them to take with you. It's a particular situation and a particular time where he's telling them, greet no one. If possible, find a way of escape. Don't be rude. Don't be antisocial, uh, but get on your way. You know that situation where uh, maybe at work you're really busy. And you get up out of your cubicle your desk out of your shack wherever it is and and you you have a a, a thing to do a, 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 a an important task to do and then you see someone coming you know it's going to be a conversation that's going to last a little while right and so you try to find a way to go down another aisle or or uh, without being rude and Jesus says don't just linger around the, 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 there's a sense of urgency here 
the harvest is ready to be uh, 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 reaped and the Lord Jesus is coming. So, one sense, if they come with nothing, as they stop in the towns, the towns are going to have to decide whether or not to receive them and provide hospitality to them or not receive them. It's going to expose the town because they've got no provisions for themselves. Uh, so, Jesus is on his way. They need to get to the preparation. Then is the relationship. How do they deal with the people? He says, enter, enter a home and stay there if they receive you and eat what is provided. Don't go house to house looking for better food, looking for a better place to stay. There's a sense in which what he's saying to us as Christians when we're on mission. By the way, uh, as a Christian, and you're living your life, and you're proclaiming to be a Christian, are you never, are you ever not on mission? No. So when I say on mission, don't think about Barry and Joe finishing their mission trip in the Dominican Republic this morning. Think about living your Christian life. It can apply to mission trips. It can apply wherever you are. Wherever you are, you are representing Christ if you're claiming to be his child. So, provide a Christian example of contentment is what he is saying here. Rather than shopping around, you know, am I going to do this Airbnb or I'm going to do this one? There's a bed and breakfast here. Which one? What am I going to? I'm going to get them all a try, you know. Is, uh, just that, uh, you know, uh, giving the impression that comfort and the niceties are more important than proclaiming the kingdom, proclaiming Christ. If you go shopping here and there, you're going to offend the one you're leaving you're going to prefer another. We are ambassadors. Again, we're representing Christ, and we need to demonstrate integrity, genuineness, faithfulness. Uh, J.C. Ryle, I read him this week. I haven't been reading him much as I work through Luke, no particular reason, but I did this week. He says, the sermon about things unseen will produce little effect when the life preaches the importance of things that are seen. So when we tell them about spiritual things and we're living as if material things are the most important, we're not going to have much impact on their life. <clears throat> their ministry, uh, beginning in verse 9, heal the sick in it, in this town that receives you and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Heal the sick and say the kingdom of God has come near. It has arrived. Uh, it's already on the scene in these cities as they're healing the sick. That's a sign. Jesus says that's a sign that the kingdom has come. They're healing in his name under his authority that he has handed over to them. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be uh, looking at Jesus in chapter 11, verse 20. He said, if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, we can spend, again... We can spend a while talking about this kingdom of God and coming and when and where and how is all of that going to happen. We can cuss about it. We can discuss about it. Cuss and discuss. I guess that, that didn't sound too good, did it? <laughs> about the coming of the kingdom. But what Jesus says here is that the kingdom has come near, Jesus is coming, the kingdom is where the king is, 
The king is here. Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. And whatever you think about the kingdom, however you view the kingdom, uh, future, present, past, however you view the kingdom, what we do know, the kingdom of God means, that, and it has come as Jesus performed his miracle. It has come. However you view the kingdom, you have to deal with the Lord Jesus because he's the king. You have to deal with the person of who Jesus is. And that's going to get thicker as we go. It's come, not in a full sense, not in a cons cons consummate sense, but it's come in a real sense as Jesus is giving the disciples the word to preach. It's come in the works of Jesus' power. It's come in the a presence of his person. And so what he says in verses 10 through 12, he really says, don't expect a warm reception everywhere you go. There in verse 10, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into the streets and Kind of do a little drama for them. You know? Take off your sandal. Shake the dust off of it. As if you're saying, look. You're not going to receive us. Well, we're going to leave even the dust of your town. To face judgment. And we're going to go to the next place. We're free, uh, 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 a, a representation of the fact that we are free from responsibility to you. What Jesus teaches in other, do not cast your pearls before swine. There's a point in which you quit talking to re those who reject the gospel. And you go on to find those who might receive it. And he says... These cities, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. They're going to sink deeper into the pit past Sodom and deep uh, on Judgment Day. It's actually what Paul and uh, Barnabas did their first missionary journey, the first city they went to, great success among the Gentiles. The Jews ran them out of Antioch, Pisidia. First thing they did before they went on to Iconium, they shook the dust off their sandals in their faces. Well, not in their faces, but as they watched them. We'll go to the next place. Don't miss Again, the kindness of Jesus' honesty. He warns these harvesters, these who are going out, they won't be welcomed everywhere. He's preparing them for what may be coming. And in the upper room, again, John 16, 4, I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you. I didn't say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Now I'm going to depart. I need to tell you some more. You're going to face persecution and don't be surprised when the world hates you. So let's look at verse 13. I'm going to read 13 to 16. Woe to you, Chorazin. Remember verse 12, he said, this city that won't receive you will be more bearable on the day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to heaven? 
you shall be exalted down to Hades. There's a danger of not receiving the message, the gospel of Christ. The reason it's more tolerable for Sodom uh, and the others on the last day is verse 16. What he says in verse 16, the one who hears you hears me. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So they're Jesus' representatives. And if the, the people reject them, then they're really rejecting Jesus. And if they reject Jesus, they're rejecting God, the one who can destroy their body and soul in hell. Don't fear men. Fear God. So this mission of the kingdom, uh, uh, of kingdom preaching and, and working, this, uh, mir these miracles and then the message really hoist up this heavy responsibility on the cities that they are, they are being visited by these disciples. Jesus pronounces woes on them. They'd already, uh, on the cities that had already seen him, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum are on the north, northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has already done miracles in all of them, and they've essentially, by and large, rejected him. These who are coming, woe to you, Chorazin, verse 13. Woe to you, Bethsaida, if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. You saw Jesus living in Capernaum with his disciples. You saw the works more than once. He has been in your area. Woe to you. If the pagans at Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon uh, over on the coast, northeast, uh, uh, northwest of, uh, of uh, Galilee, pagan cities, godless cities, arrogant, uh, Tyre and Sidon was a mega power as those from the east brought their goods to the Mediterranean Sea to be shipped over into Asia and Europe. They were powerful, but they were pagans, and they were crass people. Isaiah and Ezekiel both prophesied their ruin, yet on Judgment Day it will be less severe for them, Tyre and Sidon, than it would for Chorazin and Bethsaida because they had such advantage in, in Galilee. It makes me remember, you remember the uh, woman from Tyre and Sidon Jesus has gone out there to get away from the crowds. And she comes to him and says, my daughter uh, needs to be, has, has a demon. And Jesus says, I've come to, I'm sorry, I've come to uh, care for the, uh, to shepherd the house of Israel. Uh, he says, not good for me to give the food that belonged to the kids to the dogs. And the woman says, yeah, but even the dogs will take the scraps. She comes to Christ in humility. And Jesus says, your faith is great. And he heals her daughter. Even Tyre and Sidon would have repented if they just seen what Bethsaida and Chorazin did. But Jesus pronounces, so Jesus pronounces the woes on them. Capernaum, you won't be, your lot won't be in heaven. They'll be in Hades. Look, we need to stop and pause and think about what Jesus is really teaching here. Um, what he's saying is everyone will be judged according to their spiritual life. According to their knowledge. We're responsible. You're more responsible. You're going to walk away more responsible before God to the word of God than you were when you came. 
All will be judged according to their spiritual life. You say, well, wait, what about those who've never heard? Well, Romans 1 says they know God and they reject him anyway simply by seeing him in creation. So everyone will be judged by what they know, by their light. I think I can say no one will be condemned for what they don't know. But from those who've enjoyed the most Christian privileges, the most will be required. To whom much is given, much will be required. By the way, I hope you know that as you have lived your life in America, I don't care if you're my age or you're, you got a newborn next to you uh, this morning, however long you've lived in America, you have lived in spiritual luxury longer than anybody in church history. So what does that say about our responsibility before God? Woe unto you who reject, who, who grow up in America. If North Korea would have known what you know, they would have repented. If those in the jungles of wherever you think about, they would have repented by now. It will be easier for them on the day of judgment than for those who've grown up in the free access to the gospel of Jesus Christ for their entire lives here in America. It also shows how utterly hard an unbelieving heart is. It's possible to hear the Lord Jesus preach, to see his miracles and remain unchanged and unconverted. And you say, yeah, well, I've never seen him. If I'd have seen him, I'd have believed. Well, what Jesus just got through saying is, look, if you reject my representatives, are you rejecting me? His word is right here. A third thing, so all will be judged according to their light, how hard our heart is. Each person is responsible for the condition of his own soul. You reject the gospel, you reject, you, you remain impenitent and unbelieving of the Lord Jesus. Again, Ryle, you're not merely an object of pity and compassion. You are deeply guilty before God. Uh, you've been called by the gospel. God has spoken through his word, through his son. And you refuse. You won't regard his word your condemnation will be just. You've heard the word of truth. Your blood will be on your own hands because the judge of, judge of all the earth will do what's right. A fourth point, <clears throat> not just flagrant and open sin that condemns us. We don't have to openly oppose the Lord Jesus we only have to sit still and do nothing as the gospel is pressed. You know, you remain apathetic, careless, indifferent, uh, procrastination. Uh, I'll do that later. Presuming upon there is going to be a later for you. And ultimately, you'll end up in the pit because tomorrow never comes. I'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes as long as you put it off. You hear but not respond. You remain unaffected and end up like those cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. No sin makes less noise. But none surely, so surely damns the soul as unbelief. Again, I'm quoting Ryle. 
So that's the mission. Verse 17, they've returned. Uh, what's missing in this whole story is uh, a description of the mission. The 72 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. There's their mission report. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So what really matters? And yeah, well, they've returned with joy. There's been some success. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus turns around and, and talks about the significance of their work. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven as they were on mission, bringing the call of the kingdom. He was bringing, they were bringing defeat upon Satan, not definitely, not finally, or definitively, not definitively, but definitely, and not finally, but a real de de defeat of an ongoing, uh, one of an ongoing series of defeats for Satan throughout church history. You know, we go to Genesis 3.15, and we all know that uh, Jesus is going to crush his head, right, from Genesis 3.15. What we do kind of de-emphasize, or we often neglect this picturesque language that before he says that to Satan, what is told to Satan, what God says to Satan, dust you shall eat all the days of your life. So that implies that the serpent, our arch enemy, will experience these ongoing reverses and defeats and setbacks all along the way. And while these 72 are out, Satan falls. Jesus saw him falling. Again, I could give you a whole litany of verses for you to, we're not going to chase down that rabbit. When did Satan fall? Well, at least he fought, fell while they were preaching in, uh, <clears throat> in these cities. Jesus saw him falling. Uh, and then he assures them of their continued pr protection in verse 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on these serpents and scorpions. Uh, and, and the sense there is you still have this authority. But, verse 20, it's not a promise of immunity, right? We know that. James, the apostle, he was not protected by Jesus from being killed by Herod. Uh, so it's not a promise of immunity when he says, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Paul stoned within an inch of his life two cities after he's run out of Antioch. But the enemy can do no final harm to you as a believer in Christ. That's Jesus' point here. But that's not the most important thing that he's protecting them. Don't regard, do not rejoice in this, but rejoice in that your names are written in heaven. That's the most important thing. What's the basis of your joy? Because you come back, because you witness to somebody and they don't kick you out of their house? You say, woo, that's a success. Jesus says, don't, don't rejoice in your successes. Rejoice in the fact that his mercy is more for you, that he has saved you, and 
written your name down in the book in heaven. The, the, the basis for joy shouldn't be in the power Jesus gave them or the authority or the success of the mission. Uh, the reason they had success is that their names were written down in heaven. The thrill shouldn't be in success. The thrill should be in grace. Uh, self were they self were, were they was there a bit of pride? They returned rejoicing because the demons respond to us in your name. You remember those at the end of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. I'm not, we don't know that's true of these guys here as they return. But there's a caution here. Maybe they're satisfied in themselves, in their ministry. I mean, we all want success. We all want to matter, don't, we? don't you? Don't you want to make a difference? Yes. But Jesus warns these who are all fired up because of their victory. He warns them not to forget that success for you and me can be a time of danger for us. You know, I, I had to go back and look. The, the uh, I was reminded of Samson. He killed a lion and told nobody. Not many of us can do that. Uh, pray for humility, especially when days are peaceful, when days are going great. When our crosses are light and success and prosperity comes, we need to be extra watchful over our own hearts, ever ready to think that our own might and wisdom has gained everything. So pray, praise, thank God for any visible fruit of ministry. But the most fruit is unseen. You'll never see most of the fruit of your ministry if you're living as a Christian. Pray for the Lord to clothe you with humility as you're on mission. And then the last three verses, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Jesus rejoiced. The only time that is actually recorded that Jesus is joyful or rejoices. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son I wish and was capitalized. And should be capitalized in this verse. And the translators are way smarter than me, so they know what they're doing. And, what does it say? Anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. No one knows who the Son is but the Father. No one who knows who the Father is but the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. If you think as a Christian it's not a privileged position, you need to meditate and memorize verse 22. Um, it's God's will to hide things, hide these things. And it's God's will to reveal these things. That's what he says, verse 21. 
that you have hidden these things from, notice who he hides them from, the wise and the understanding, and revealed them to little children, for such was your gracious will. That's why Clint read 1 Corinthians 1. I look out, uh, not many of you are nobility. Not many of you are billionaires. Not many of you are the talk of the town. The Lord has shamed the nobility and billionaires in the talk of the town with ordinary people who have an extraordinary Savior. And so we can boast in nothing. Clint didn't read the last verse. His secretary didn't put it on the bulletin. And for those of you who are visiting, that's me. But as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We've got nothing to brag about. That's why it's all of grace. Uh, these things, you know, boast, verse 20, uh, or, or verse 22, all things have been handed over to me. Wait, no, I'm sorry. Tw uh, 21, You've hidden these things from the wise, and that's that your names are written in heaven, the, the glorious gospel. How often do we marvel at the baffling, unsearchable ways of God? Are you ever baffled by how it is that God works things out? Uh, I was reading Ryle. I don't know if you know much about J.C. Rowell. In the mid-1800s, he's writing. Here's what he said in the mid-1800s. Why is England a Christian country? He's talking about the, 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 the mysterious ways of God. And he says, why is it England is a Christian country and China is buried in idolatry? A problem we cannot solve. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. The mysterious ways of God in 1850 are even more mysterious today. There are more being saved in China, and England is one of the most pagan uh, countries of all. 150 years ago, God has turned it upside down and will say exactly with Ryle, even so, Father, it seemed good in your sight. I don't get it, but God does. God does. And his ways are mysterious. And then Jesus says he's got his own authority. All things have been handed down to me. We know that he says that at the Great Commission, but he, hadn't, he wasn't given that as he ascends. He says that already all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. No one who knows the Son, and no one knows the Son who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and to anyone whom he chooses to reveal. Jesus even marveled. He's rejoicing. Don't be like Chorazin and Bethsaida here. He speaks of this unique relationship between the Father and the Son. I don't want to pick on, well, no, I don't need to do that. Things come to my mind, it's just you, you be amazed. That Jesus can say that there is a unique relationship between him and the Father, between the Father and the Son. But what they have together, none other has ever known, right? But he doesn't end, he puts and to anyone whom the Son cho chooses to reveal them. No one knows the Father but the Son unless the Son chooses to reveal him to you or to me. Then we might know the Father, not in the same way they know each other, but we might know the Father in a real way. 
anyone to whom he chooses. It's Jesus' decision. All things have been handed over to him. For some, so much authority in one place chafes. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was in a cabinet meeting. Seven of his cabinet members, they were cussing and discussing a situation. Lincoln was, uh, so they held a vote. Seven nays and one yay. The one yay was Lincoln. So he reports, seven nays, one yay, the yays have it. He's the president. And in the cabinet meeting, he reigns and he rules. So does the Lord Jesus. Your knowing the Father ultimately rests upon his decisions. Not everyone's happy about that again, but little children that are mentioned, whom he reveals this to, bow and worship at his feet. So, just one last verse. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. The privilege of living on this side of the cross is we can't imagine. The Old Testament saints truly had faith in a coming Christ. But once the Lord Jesus came and lived and died and was raised and ascended to the right hand, so many hundreds of scriptures were unlocked. And you have access and you have knowledge uh, that King David never had, and the prophet Isaiah never had, and the prophets would preach, and then Peter says they would try to sort out who is it are we talking about, and when are all these, and it, they're told it's not for you to know. It's for some other people to know. That's you and me. And woe unto you, PBC. You don't hear the word. The call of the kingdom. The humblest Christian believer understands things that these Old Testament saints who are just as saved could never explain. Believers, we should close out realizing our, our great debt to our God. I think we sing it in his mercy is more. There's a debt we can't pay. Our responsibility is great because of the full light of the gospel. Be sure to make use of your many privileges because to whom much is given, much will be required. So maybe you've not become a new creature in Christ yet. Maybe you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you're waiting. Maybe you're not under. Since Jesus is the one who chooses, he is your only hope to not be with Sodom in the pit at the end. So cry out to him. Call on his name. Call on his name to save you in his mercy. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we see the commission. We see the calling. We know, Lord, that you are, uh, you are the captain. You are the king.
Lord, convict your people and convince the lost, those not yet new creatures in Christ, for the sake of your kingdom, it might go forth you call your people your ambassadors may we represent you in the power of the spirit to your glory amen well i'd love to chat with you if you'd like to talk a little bit about any of these things let's stand and we'll be dismissed with a benediction not a particular scripture the congregation of the Lord Jesus in all your darkness and troubles remember what you are and what you have you've been loved with an everlasting love you are supported by everlasting arms you are recipients of everlasting life and heirs of an everlasting kingdom all sealed and made sure by the blood of an everlasting covenant Amen.